Okay, everyone. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are in the world. Um, my name is Alison Meston, and I'm the Communications Director with the ISC, the International Science Council. Um, this is one of a series of knowledge sharing Zooms that we're going to be uh, doing over the coming few months, I hope. And uh, I really hope today's session on, on knowledge sharing on online conferences um, is the type of session that we all need at the end of this, uh, this very strange and interesting year that we've all had. I want to do some housekeeping first. So this session is being recorded um, and the recording of these presentations will be available afterwards. So if you're an ISC member, we would welcome you to share this with other um, colleagues in your in your unions or your academies um, and I would ask that you mute yourselves so this is not a webinar this is a, a zoom meeting so I would ask that you mute yourselves during the presentations we're going to have about an hour of, of discussions and presentations from some guests and then we'll have a chance to to have a, a, a discussion and ask your questions and I always think it's good if you are going to ask a question that you do turn on your video so we can see who you are. I'll be moderating that session later on. So uh, today's agenda, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Peter Squat, who is a, a conference organiser and he's going to talk about reimagining the future of events. Uh, Genia Soy, our digital manager, is then going to give us uh, a session on uh, the different types of platforms that we can use. Um, and then we're going to hear from um, Angie olanoka Pakun. I hope I pronounced that right, Angie, um, from, the, uh, from the NAS transition, and she's going to speak on transition to virtual meetings. And then we'll hear from Joanna Wild, who's going to show us how we can go digital and get success. And finally, we'll hear from Gilles Sion, who is with Future Earth and uh, the reason we've asked Jill is because Future Earth had a very uh, big in-person meeting planned at the beginning of the year and had to suddenly change to online conferencing. So from my point of view, um, as, a, as communications director at the ISC, I already felt that sometimes the way we gathered, whether they were at scientific conferences or at UN conferences, I already felt even before the pandemic that we could do better. And in order to help me, I've put this in the chat. I bought um, Priya Parker's book called The Art of Gathering. And she really challenged us to think about why we are gathering in the first place. And that over the last few or uh, many years of gathering, whether it's at conferences or family events, uh, we needed to rethink and reimagine the way we gathered. And I also think about us as a science community. And I think about uh, the uh, International Telecommunications Union, which is the oldest inter intergovernmental body in the world. And I think about how scientists communicated a hundred years ago. They didn't fly around the world to meet each other at conferences. They communicated in different ways and some of the biggest scientific discoveries and scientific changes happened during times of communication that uh, weren't face to face or weren't in person. So I almost feel we've gone full circle and that people have embraced uh, this kind of technology. But I also think that even now the art of gathering, the art of gathering online already needs a reboot after eight months of, of, of Zooming and some of us have Zoom fatigue. So I'm really looking forward to today and I'm going to hand over to our first guest, Peter Schwartz. Thank you very much, Peter. Alison, good morning uh, and good morning to everybody online. So I'm not going to switch to a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I much more prefer connecting with you and seeing your faces uh, on the screen. So I'm connecting uh, with you from uh, the capital city in South Africa, uh, Pretoria. Uh, it is, if I look outside, uh, it is summer, it is warm. 
Uh, we are preparing for the holidays and the festivities uh, within, obviously, within the constraints of the COVID environment. Um, so it's a good time of year um, in South Africa. And then traditionally in our space, this is also just past the normal peak season uh, for events. Um, and the business events, the conferencing, would now be winding down and make place for uh, more social events uh, happening. Of course, very little of those would be um, going forward. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Alison and for inviting me to talk to you, um, the IEC members, uh, from wherever you are. And this is really uh, the benefit of how we are connecting nowadays in a decentralized manner. So previously we had to move from various locations to one location to meet. And as Alison said, uh, in the art of meetings, the questions are being asked now uh, from our participants, from our speakers. Why in the world would you want to travel um, given the latest experiences halfway across the world to go and sit in a meeting room listen quietly to a presenter with very little engagement, um, meet or socialize uh, with one or two or three individuals, and then return on a journey of half a day, a full day, or in some certain instances, one and a half days back to your original location. Um, at uh, an option that can now be done at a fraction of the cost. So you may have joined this uh, conversation for different reasons, um, either um, to validate what you already know, uh, to learn different perspectives or to find solutions. And hopefully we'll be able as a collective to provide some answers uh, to those questions that, that came through. So right off the bat, I just wanna put it out uh, that there's no silver bullet. Um, there's no one solution that will uh, provide an answer uh, to your needs. And the um, answer lies in, 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 in the quantification of needs. The fact that my needs and my client's needs differ from your needs, your audience or your constituents. So there is no cookie cutter approach. So we'll aim from our experiences um, to address what, what, what you raised. Essentially, um, over many years uh, in the in-person environment, we move towards best practice principles. So we try to innovate, do what we did better and build from one year on top of another year, uh, creating different experiences. But in most instances, those were retroactive. So we were um, really looking out to what technology offered us and then we applied those technologies into events. So gradually we moved in a next, uh, uh, into a next practice phase. Um, so next practice was the advent of the digital environment. So the digital environment, as you all know, is not new. Um, we had a hybrid conference for the past 10 years. To what extent have you applied the hybrid conferences? Um, that is for you to answer. Maybe you were still looking at it. So what essentially was on the horizon has now been pushed by COVID right to your uh, doorstep. And we all had to learn how to do full online events. So that ranges in spectrum from what we are experiencing now, having a Zoom meeting with um, limited engagement uh, options to uh, full on online events that would replicate um, a large number of components of in-person events to the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, so one of my first questions to you is, how do you, as an organization view your event? Do you view it as an asset? Most organizations haven't really thought about this, um, that their events are assets. And if it is an asset, if you have identified as an asset, how do you treat it as an asset? Um, do you protect it? Uh, do you protect the brand? 
Have you determined the value of this event to your organization? And once you've answered those questions, you probably would tie the need of that event to the value that it presents, both to your organization and to your constituents. And that will lead to the next step. So if you are then going to continue going into the future of events, what will those events look like? Well, what I can tell you is that it's not going to look like your 2019 events, and it's probably not going to look like your 2020 events. So your 2021 events is going to have to be fully professionalized in the way that it's presented. Because in this year, I think we've gone through a honeymoon period where we had to make adjustments going from in-person to full online or full digital events. And to a certain degree, our audience has had a lot of patience with us. Um, that patience will not exist next year. Um, this year, we had the opportunity to trial. Next year, our clients are going to expect professional uh, productions from us. Um, so, we are really in uncharted uh, territories at the moment. And I wish we all had the crystal ball. So where do we look for answers? I can tell you where I look for answers. So I do a lot of reading um, and I look to my own industry. And perhaps this is a source for you guys to consider as well. Um, a lot of free information available about the developing concepts of events taking place, um, being published by the Convene magazine um, that is owned by the PCMA, the Professional Convention Management Association. Um, and uh, what a Professional Convention Management Association consists out of 7,000 me members uh, representing 50,000 individuals. And in a recent survey uh, conducted to all their members, asked them about what will 2021 look for them and their clients? And looking forward, what can they expect? 80% of those members said that uh, 2021 will be online, uh, full online to them still. Um, and then 2022 going forward. So entering your midterm process is only when they are looking um, at opening up to uh, in-person events. Obviously, in-person events to a certain degree can still happen. Many are waiting for uh, vac vaccinations and vaccines to be the silver bullet to returning to in-person. But there's a psychological effect at play here as well. And when would these audiences be ready to re-engage in-person? Um, now having learned the different benefits um, of, of the online um, engagements. That is going to take some time. It is what we have seen from our own clients is that on our international conferences, um, all of them have been moved out from uh, 2021, either converted to um, online events or being postponed um, to an, a, a, later, a later date uh, coming up in 20. 22. A factor to consider as well, going, looking at events going into the future is looking at our own supply chains. So we've seen an absolutely devastating effect um, on our event supply chain. Facilities, um, audiovisual companies, um, exhibition providers, uh, professional conference organizers, where the vast majority of those in our local environment have gone out of business. So looking at events into the future, uh, we also need to be cognizant of what the supply chain would look like and how much time would be required for our supply chains to recover. What will this look like in 2021, 2022 and going beyond that? because we are, as we all know, fully dependent on a proper um, supply chain to roll events out successfully. So 
What are our key learnings uh, from um, uh, the conversion from in-person events to uh, online? Uh, so probably the major difference between the in-person and the online is the realization that in an in-person event, when you present from the stage, it's a presentation from one person to many, and the events are designed in that way. Whereas in the online environment, it is a one-to-one -one connection broadcasted to many. Um, and that changes the narrative on how online events are being designed. So the next realization um, that we came across is that there's a narrative out there that uh, online events take a lot less time uh, to organize than in-person events, when in fact the opposite is true. Um, all of a sudden, what you had available as resources in a much larger team needs to be done by an organizer. So just take one component, your speaker administration and the speaker management and the uploading of presentations, the briefings that needs to take place. So much more time is now being spent by a centralized office where previously you had different resources from your uh, audiovisual teams, um, your venue and facility uh, teams that could assist you in bringing this event together. That is now done by one core team. All the different components that apply in the planning of um, online or rather in-person events apply now to online events. You are still going through your strategic and design phases. You are still going through your budget phases. You are still going through your project planning phases. You are still going through your program design, your speaker identification, speaker briefing. You are still doing an engagement strategy. You are still promoting the message, marketing the message, arranging the engagement, doing the registrations um, and everything that follows on to that. You are still looking at security measures, data security, um, broadcast security. Um, there are so many more spinning gears that you are responsible for as an organizer in the online environment. But consider that you have to go through all your notions. You are still doing what you did, but you are doing it differently. On each one of those components, the application in the online environment is different than the in-person. And one needs to be aware of that so that you can plan for it. Um, so that is, in essence, um, what I want to leave you with is one thought uh, before we return um, to other speakers and listening to their presentation and getting to the specific questions. The one thought that I wanna leave you with is, um, what can you achieve as a collective that an individual cannot? And if you tie that into your online strategy, you are probably going to go for a winning uh, solution. You can answer that question in your program. So thank you with that. Um, I think my time is up. So Alison, I'm reverting back to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for, for sticking on time, which is another art of online gathering. Um, I think you've given us a number of challenges and I think the key, I've got five key takeaways from your discussion. Um, one of them is the professionalism of online events and that already at the end of 2020, we are starting to consider how professional our online events are. The supply chain for future hybrid or in-person events is something that I just didn't consider until you have mentioned it. And I guess that also goes for, for the airline industry as well. I mean, I know right now flights are very expensive and I know this is an issue for science unions and researchers. 
Um, the third thing is online takes just as long as, uh, or if not longer than uh, in-person events. And again, I have to say, I'm always flabbergasted at how long it takes to organize uh, a one hour or one and a half hour online event. And you mentioned security measures. And I think this is something that uh, we might need to consider how we can, how the ISC and if there's a place and a role for us to, to maybe have a handbook for online um, and where to go for those security measures. Okay, I'm going to, uh, oh, and lastly, you challenge us to think about the collective and the individual. And I think that goes back to what I said before about the art of gathering and that any online event has to be the same as a, an in-person event. Why are we doing this? What are our goals? Uh, what are we achieving by bringing people together? I'm going to hand over to our Digital Communications Officer, uh, Zhenya Tsui, and she's going to give us uh, a little presentation on the different types of uh, platforms that we've been using. Thank you, Zhenya. Thank you, Alison. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Zhenya Tsui. Uh, I'm working on Digital Communications at the IEC, and today we'll talk about platforms for online interaction. Consider it to be more like a case study of uh, the IEC and our experiences in 2020, and hopefully some of them will be uh, helpful for you as well. So we'll talk about uh, different types of interactions and various platforms which are suitable for each, uh, what features are available on uh, various platforms, how much they cost, and I'll finish off with a few fun additions to uh, your meetings and online events that can um, spice up the conversations and make it more uh, fun. So in 2020, we had 16 public events, which varied greatly in size from smaller ones where we had uh, just 50 uh, registrants to several hundred registrants, averaging at about 260 uh, registrations per event. Attendance was 52%, uh, meaning uh, every second person who registered actually attended the event and the retention rate was 68%. So retention here, I mean, by retention here, I mean the share of people who, uh, when signing up for the event, also decided to opt in for our newsletter. And I wanted to focus on this metric just a little bit more because for us, it was a great way to grow highly relevant and segmented audiences who were actively seeking our content, who were very interested in our activities. And it was, uh, again, a, a great uh, side effect, so to say, of, on, of holding events online because it was more organic and natural for them to sign up for a, a newsletter while also signing up for the, for the event. Um, uh, Peter briefly mentioned different types of interactions, so they can be one-on-one, -on -one, just a regular bilateral call. It, it can be a many-to-many -many where many people can talk to other many people, like in a regular meeting. You can have one-to-many where uh, you have one or few speakers talking at the audience, and then you can have a mixture, um, a combination of these three. Uh, it might be... Um, obvious that uh, for different types of these interactions, you might need a different platform, but too often there are webinars uh, which might very, uh, much better be served uh, on a meeting platform instead. And for example, this meeting is uh, set up as a Zoom meeting deliberately, not a Zoom webinar, because we don't want to talk at you, but we want to talk with you so we can exchange knowledge and talk with each other and brainstorm some more ideas. And then on the other hand, there are many meetings that could be better served by a webinar platform where you have more organization, more control, fewer distractions. So uh, as a first step for whenever we create an event, we think, what, what do we want to achieve with this? And what kind of interactions we expect? And, and only then we decide what kind of platform we'll use for that. So at the IEC, we start with the regular many-to-many -many platforms such as GoToMeeting, Zoom webinars, uh, or Zoom meetings, and uh, we realized that it wasn't enough. So we purchased uh, one-to-many platforms for webinars. So we could have recordings, polls and Q&As, live streaming. Uh, we could have some reporting and analytics. But even that was not enough. So we realized that we want to do a lot more with our online events. We want people to be able to network, to jump between parallel sessions. We wanted to be able to feature uh, our partners in the expo section, for example, and have more control over custom design of our events. 
And uh, obviously, these platforms that we've been using before, they were not uh, uh, they were they were not fit for these purposes. So we started looking for other platforms, and there were so many of them. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of all the platforms. Uh, just a quick snapshot to to make a case uh, and to show different types of platforms and how they organize, and most importantly, how they are priced. Uh, so when we started looking into uh, different platforms, we realized that uh, there are a lot of uh, subtle differences which influence pricing. We're going to share the slide later on, so you'll have um, uh, you'll be able to have a closer look at different things that are put in here. So I'm just going to focus on pricing at the moment. Uh, essentially, we um, realized that there are three main types of pricing. For example, like the first one where you pay per platform. So you pay to access the platform, and then you have uh, multiple or unlimited events. Then uh, there are others where you pay per person, whether a person who registers or a person who attends. And then you can pay a flat fee per event, where you just pay uh, for an event, and then you can have uh, a limited or an unlimited number of participants. Or you can also have a combination of these three in some kind of mix uh, of pricing, pricing model. And when we looked at all these uh, pricing options, it was uh, quite overwhelming because we were comparing oranges to apples and it was uh, dif difficult to assess what would be the most cost efficient model for us, giving our needs, giving our attendance and uh, our ambition. So uh, what was very useful for us is to have a uh, pricing simulation analysis where we uh, just imagine different scenarios. What if we had a lot of big events? What if we had uh, a few small events? What if we had um, a combination of this of these two? And then we uh, calculated the price for each. And then for us, um, a model which was uh, charging per platform plus an additional small fee per participant was uh, the, the most cost efficient. So this is not a product placement for hoping uh, the platform that we chose, but more like a recommendation for an exercise which we found very useful in assessing our needs and how much resources we should be expected to put, to put, to put in and uh, the kind of platform and model that works best for us. Uh, now, if you're not really looking for a big platform to hold your events and you're just looking for a little addition to the existing uh, events interactions, uh, I put together just a few um, uh, fun additions that, uh, that are being, being used by other teams. Uh, trivia are a, an obvious example, and Kahoot has been widely popular uh, in the recent years, so it's a trusted and uh, widely used uh, app, uh, which, which is built to, to make people competitive. So, and when people are competitive, they obviously engage. So it's an easy and quick way to uh, bring more interactions into your regular meetings. Then we can have team building uh, or ice breaking games and among us also has been very popular recently. And as you can judge by the design, it's simplistic and the, the rules are easy and it's a controlled environment where people sort of have to interact and it's a nice way for people to have a little bit of fun, but then also get to know each other a little bit better. And then you can also have your regular meeting, but uh, change the environment. Uh, so you have your regular meeting, but then you have avatars or you, uh, you have the same people, but the, uh, the, the whole environment is a little bit different. And some teams go as far as to creating um, or signing up whole teams for online games. This is a, quite an extreme example, but it's being done. For example, this user um, on Twitter mentioned that uh, Zoom sucks. We started having editorial meetings in Red Dead Redemption, which is an online game. It's nice to see that they can fire and discuss projects with the wolves howling out in the night. So it's another way to make it, to make the environment different uh, to the point where uh, it feels different and it helps to fight this uh, infamous Zoom fatigue. And uh, for their team, it works pretty well. So I'm gonna uh, leave it here. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And if you have uh, experience holding events online and whether you, uh, if you, try some of the event platforms. It would be great to talk with you and uh, uh, hear about your experience. Thank you, Allison.
Thank you very much, Shenya. And um, again, that presentation will be available to everyone. And in fact, uh, the International Science Council, we had our first uh, hop in experience on Friday where we had um, Friday afternoon drinks and instead of having Zoom, we had it on hop in and it was the first time for most of us to experience that and it was nice to experience it in a light hearted way without the pressure of an actual conference or meeting. Um, and as most of you know, we'll be having a, an electronic General Assembly in February. So it was another good way for our team to practice online conferencing. Well, look, I'm going to bring in Angie um, Oli Pekan now. She's the Senior Program Officer at the Nigerian Academy of Science. And I, I love the way um, that uh, the Nigerian Academy is so active. And it's a real honor to have Angie with us because I'm really looking forward to hearing from a science academy and how they've pivoted um, in their in their work uh, to get their online conferencing across. So Angie, over to you. Good morning, everyone all. Hello. Um, can we all see my slides? I have some slides up. Alison, please could you help me confirm that? Your, we, we just, we don't see your screen, Angie, I'm sorry. It just says you have started screen sharing, but but you have not sh shared your actual screen. You. Now we can see you. Fantastic. Okay, good. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Angie Olan Pepon, a senior program officer with the Nigerian Academy of Science. And I'll just be taking us briefly into how NAS has been able to transition to virtual meetings through this um, global pandemic. So um, COVID officially came into Nigeria in February of this year. And by March, given the rate at which um, the disease was spreading, the NAS secretariat was closed down and the academy called for a national lockdown of the country. By the last day or so of March, the government instituted a national lockdown and we all had to get used to the new reality of working from home and trying to balance all of that with home responsibilities <clears throat> as well. And, and just before you go on, I need you to move your Zoom panel because we have a rectangle over your... Yeah, just move the Zoom panel a little, little bit and then we'll be fine. Thank you. Perfect. Fine. Great. Good. Thank you. Okay. So I um, mean, dealing with the realities of working from home, we at the NAS sector began to ask, <clears throat> how do we keep um, the team working together? And how do we continue to engage with stakeholders um, in a time where science advice is very important and critical? So we, in the time between April and June of this year, we started exploring how we could transition into virtual convenings. So we um, explored the available platforms on ground. We looked into a number of them and we decided that the Zoom platform would work best for our needs. And given that it was at that time very popular here, a lot of people had had to download Zoom for one virtual meeting or the other. So we decided on Zoom and we started using Zoom for our meetings. First internally, we started um, with team meetings a few times a week, and then having um, meetings of NAS, com various NAS committees virtually as well. And in all of that, we were learning while doing, getting comfortable with Zoom, learning how to use it for virtual meetings. So um, in at about July, in July of this year, we started, we came up with the um, concept of having a webinar series on COVID-19 in Nigeria to explore the government's response and how um, the pandemic had affected various aspects of life here in Nigeria. So the first webinar in that series sought to see how um, the government response was integrating science advice. So we hosted this event with the Zoom webinar add-on, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. We had a registration link, which we um, shared 
across our network via social media. If we had an ad in the newspaper, we sent emails inviting um, relevant stakeholders to um, register to participate in this event. For this first webinar, the response and reception was very good. In the first 48 hours of sending out the registration link, we had about 120 people who had registered to participate. So there was a lot of interest in that first attempt at a virtual meeting. So we had the first webinar in August. We had a total of 250 registrants. But out of that, we had 140 people actually in attendance. We had four speakers and the webinar ran for about two hours. So the format we used was to first have a, before the start of the webinar, have a practice session with the speakers to be sure they had a good briefing on what the expectations of the webinar were. Then we had presentations for the first 40 minutes or so of the webinar. And then we, the rest of the time was um, dedicated to question and answers. Um, we used the Zoom Q&A tab or button for, for that to take questions from the participants. But where time allowed, we also um, allowed a few people to ask questions like. So um, after that first webinar, which went very well, our confidence in convening virtual events grew and we were getting more familiar with working with Zoom for, for that. So we had a couple of other virtual events in September. We had a virtual media roundtable, which is one of the events that the Academy has during the course of the year anyway. But this was the first time we, that we had that meeting virtually, where we, we typically bring members of the press to engage with scientists on various issues. And we then had another webinar in the COVID-19 Series we dealt on exploring the impact of the pandemic and the measures put in place to con control the spread of the disease on higher education institutions here in Nigeria. So moving into October, we um, faced a new challenge with um, the opportunity to convene bilingual virtual meetings in French and English. The first of these meetings was held in October. We worked with the academies in Benin Republic, Ghana, Kina Faso, and Senegal on this. We had a series of four webinars to disseminate um, policy recommendations on COVID-19. In December, last week to be precise, we had a second bilingual webinar which focused on science, discussing science advice in health emergencies, and this was convened in partnership with the Academy in Benin Republic and the Nigerian Young Academy. So for these bilingual events, we use Zoom interpretation feature. Zoom um, allows you to enable interpretation and have one of the participants in the meeting assigned as an interpreter to provide a separate audio channel so that other people who want to listen in another language can tune into that separate channel. So for the first web bilingual webinar that we had, the first 10 minutes of it were a bit <laughs> interesting because for some reason, though we had walked through the process with the interpreter who we had engaged with practice, but in the meeting, it just wasn't working. We just couldn't figure out what exactly was going on. But with a lot of troubleshooting, we were able to sort it out and everything went seamlessly after that. And subsequently, we haven't had such occurrences and all our bilingual events have gone as planned. So in all of these that we have been able to do, all these virtual events in the last five months, I think we've been able to do eight of them. What we've learned is that virtual events, though not a complete replacement for physical events, can be as effective um, they offer an ease in convening, though it has been said here that um, they take longer, but I have found that um, some of the logistic um, planning that go into physical meetings are kind of removed in virtual meetings. There's also an ease of participation for participants, just the click of a button, really. 
Zoom in particular offers a lot of um, inbuilt support for organizers. It generates a lot of reports, a lot of statistics. You're able to know who was in your meeting, who didn't come. You're able to follow up on people who didn't turn up. The opportunities for integration with other social media platforms for live streaming. There's also, you can also generate automatic reminders to registered participants. So Zoom offers quite a lot in that regard. But um, conversely, we've also found that Zoom fatigue has started to creep in. People have to attend so many virtual meetings and they're becoming a little tired of that. There's also the issue of holding um, attention in a virtual meeting. We found that we can only have people for two or so hours before they, their attention might try to start to drift or there might be distractions and you might not have their full engagement and participation. Um, next is another disadvantage is the cost of participation on the participants because they need to get um, an internet plan to be able to participate in all the virtual meetings that they need to join in. And for us here in Nigeria, there's, um, there's starting to be a little return to normalcy. Um, um, the restrictions that have been put in place to curtail COVID-19, some of them have been taken off and people are, are free to move around, though they still need to wear their face masks and maintain social distance. So people are getting back to their lives and might not have the time to sit down in one place for a virtual meeting any longer. So we've seen a little drop in the conversion rates from registrants to participants. So um, with that, I will say thank you for your attention and I hope this was useful. Thank you so much, Angie. That was great. And I think it's really good to be able to have a practical uh, view of your journey this year. And I think your experience is very similar to ours in that we had quite good attention uh, at the beginning of the year. But as we've moved on, I really do think people are suffering from uh, Zoom fatigue. And it speaks to what Peter has said. How do we, how do we change our online events? How do we make sure they're professional um, and, and so on. So I want to um, bring in uh, Joanna now, who's the Senior Program Specialist for Digital Learning Design at the International Network for Advancing Science and Policy, INASP. Um, Joanna, I'm really looking forward to your presentation because we've had some questions online about uh, using online for, for teaching and and research questions. So I'm hoping that uh, some of your presentation will also cover the use of uh, e events and, and teaching on an online world. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you can see my slides. Um, so uh, INASP, very briefly about, about INASP to give you some context. INASP is an international development organization with a global network of partners in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and uh, our vision is of research and knowledge at the heart of development. And we have nearly 30 years of experience of, in supporting the capacity of individuals and institutions to produce, share, and use research and knowledge. And we are specialists in employing online training uh, approaches, uh, online collaboration spaces, massive open online courses and e-mentoring approaches. And today I would like to share with you what we believe makes our approach to online learning fast and facilitation successful. Uh, we think um, uh, it's four key aspects. Uh, firstly, we spend time carefully thinking about what uh, digital technology can mean for the context of our work. We have developed our own uh, digital principles that help us uh, make decisions about when and how we use digital technology to deliver our work. Uh, secondly, our work is based on uh, evidence of what works. We've been uh, learning and systematically collecting data and feedback from our interventions. And this has helped us to identify key factors that need to be um, considered before designing any online inter intervention and which we then integrated into our own scoping um, and design process. Thirdly, we use learning design methodology, which puts the learner 
and the facilitator, not the facilitator at the center of the design process. It's also um, explicit in nature. It means that the knowledge of the audience um, and the context is articulated and represented in the design decisions. Um, it's also participatory. Uh, we work with our critical friends from the target audience and it's iterative in, in nature. So frequent food feedback loops and adaptation. Um, fourthly and finally, our approach is technology enhanced and not technology driven. It means that we recognize um, that online learning is complementary to more traditional approaches to capacity development. We do not uh, simply seek to replace uh, approaches such as workshops with online modes of delivery. Instead, we use technology to enhance what we do. We use both digital and physical spaces uh, to their greatest advantage and in the best combination. Currently, a lot of us um, are having to transition to online out of necessity rather than what, is, what was planned in the first place as part, for instance, of our workshops um, and as the best means to achieve our goals. So in the times of global pandemic, really, we need to take an advantage even more of what digital technology can offer. We need to be more creative. We need to think outside of the box. And at the same time, we also need to understand what the limitations of technology are. Uh, what then do we need to think about right now um, in terms of delivery in an online only environment? Um, our key recommendations are, um, and tips are included in uh, this on infographic. I'm going to talk um, in more detail through some of these. Uh, if you are interested um, in uh, learning about this in more detail yourself, two weeks ago, we launched an online facilitation tutorial uh, that you can access uh, anytime at any cost um, and I'm going to share the details at the end of the presentation. So first recommendation is that people and pedagogy should always come before technology. Uh, in the years of delivering online learning we have learned that you really need to build in a scoping activity at the beginning of your digital project whatever it is. It doesn't have to cost a lot of effort and time but uh, you need to find a quick and efficient way of getting to know your audience. Um, the questions to explore should include aspects such as learning habits, existing communication channels, bandwidth limitations, access to devices, digital learning skills. And if you collect answers to those questions, you will be then uh, able to make informed decisions about the type of technology we'll use, whether communication should be asynchronous or synchronous, uh, whether your course should be blended or fully online. For us at INAS, the priority is people and not platforms to avoid um, a new digital divide. It is important to put learning first and see technology only as means to the end. So let me give you an example uh, here of um, our self-study course in critical thinking. Um, we had developed it in collaboration with our partners in Tanzania in response to a growing demand for teaching students how to think critically to get them ready for employment. And the same need was then identified in Sierra Leone, but there the context was different, very different to East Africa. And we had to start um, again with a scoping activity. In the first workshop in Sierra Leone, we um, quickly demonstrated the course, but then we listened more than we talked and we wanted to understand the audience and the needs. Uh, we understood the internet wasn't stable enough and we decided to offer the course through a local network using Raspberry Pi, a small uh, portable computer. Then Moodle learning platform, which the course was on, was um, on Raspberry Pi and this computer provided a small local network that could be used in the classroom. And then the COVID started and um, we need and we had to adapt to, to the new context again. So we started providing snippets in conversations with teachers there. We started providing snippets of course content through WhatsApp groups. Um, so the course content was transformed into one pagers and the lecturers would send uh, one such snippet per day to the students through WhatsApp groups. Um, our second recommendation is to design for an online experience from the start and refraining from replicating face-to-face -face solutions. Uh, too often, uh, online learning is seen as simply changing the medium of delivery without changing pedagogy. And the truth is, however, that interaction dynamics in online spaces are very different to face-to-face -face setting. 
So the key message is whatever you do, do not replicate face-to-face -face design. Step back and look anew at the purpose of your intervention and how online pedagogy and digital technology can enhance what you do. An example um, that I would like to give you here is our monitoring and evaluation course for library consortia, which used to be offered as a three-day workshop. For sustainability reasons, we decided to offer this learning opportunity online. And instead of having a workshop on Zoom or similar platform, we realized that the greatest benefit for learners of doing this course online would be they could do it in their own time and apply what they learn immediately within the context of their work. So we developed a six week course, provided technical content and examples, and at the same time, encouraged participants to work on a useful assignment throughout the course uh, that was very relevant to their work. If the participants then didn't uh, have enough information to answer the questions for the assignments, they had enough time to talk to their colleagues within their work, to find the information and continue with the assignments. So they were doing really learning by doing, and um, they were doing something that, that was very relevant to their work and useful to their context. So um, third recommendation is um, coming from what we've learned from the success of our massive open online courses. Um, we learned that social presence is a key factor in maintaining participants' engagement on the course and reducing dropout rates. Um, to give you an example of how we facilitate social interaction in MOOCs um, that have between 2,000 and 3,000 participants in one run, we have developed a guest facilitation model. Uh, we engage our vast community in supporting facilitation on the courses. Guest facilitators join the lead facilitators in the effort to keep conversations in the discussions from flowing. And the response from the community was amazing, uh, with many people happy to dedicate their own time to support others. And the courses have been running for four years now uh, with support of this pool of guest facilitators. Uh, so we believe that it's largely due to this model uh, and guest facilitation that uh, the completion rates of uh, our MOOCs are ex exceptionally high, uh, reaching 50%, which for MOOCs, as you might know, is, is a very high completion rate. Um, online learning offers an opportunity to reach harder to reach demographics and locations. Our MOOCs are accessed by people in countries and regions affected by conflict and unrest. And, and by displaced people, knowing that we reach diverse uh, demographics has helped us think about how best to serve learners in less accessible situations. So we have courses that are low, low bandwidth and mostly asynchronous, designed for flexible deadlines, downloadable versions of, of online lessons, and we design for mobile learning. And it's also important to think about users who are differently abled, for example, through choice of images, colors, fonts, screen reading technology, adding subtitles and using all text on images. So you really need to be, um, you really need to your, know your audience to be inclusive. Uh, for example, when analyzing feedback from our MOOCs, we have learned that female participants uh, from Somalia find MOOCs overwhelming, and we are now developing new options for delivering the same content for smaller communities with local facilitation. And finally, um, all our INAS capacity development approaches are underpinned by principle of sustainability and local ownership. With this in mind, our course material is developed and structured into packages that can be easily downloaded, customized, and embedded into partners' own platforms. And we support this process from the onset working with our partners and taking over the courses. For example, we have created as well an online course with, uh, which trains anyone interested in how to download, adapt and facilitate the content of our research writing MOOCs locally. And this has successfully supported many completers uh, to deliver the research writing course in their own institution. Um, as mentioned previously, um, we are pleased to announce that the launch of our newly um, freely available self-paced tutorial um, facilitating events and courses in an online world. Um, the tutorial uh, was developed in response to our partners' needs and provides practical guidance on how to get started with online events and training activities and how to facilitate them. Uh, the total learning time is about 12 hours and it consists of four units, which is introduction to online facilitation, including benefits and challenges. Then we have a module on moving events online, uh, a module on facilitating online events with some suggestions for activities, and finally a module on facilitating online courses. Thank you very much. 
you very much, Joanna. And, uh, you know, again, I think you, like, like uh, Angie's presentation, your presentation was also about the key learnings that you've had in, as, as an organisation. Um, and again, I think sustainability is a big issue that will be coming up in future online conferences. There's a bit of chat going on in the chat box um, around things like hybrid events and uh, online uh, and sustainability practices. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to that when we talk uh, after we hear from Gilles. So Gilles, it's over to you. I'm looking forward to your presentation because um, Future Earth had to pivot this conference uh, very quickly and the feedback that we received from colleagues who attended this online conference was really positive. So um, I'm excited to, to hear this presentation. So Gilles, over to you. Great, thank you very much. I'm uh, honoured to hear that there was lots of positive news uh, coming out of our event. So my name is Gilles uh, and I'm... Gilles, uh, we're a bit... It's, it's, it looks like there's a shadow. Uh, oh, that's, oh, okay. so can, can you just maybe try just again? A second, yeah. Because online activities tend to have technical issues. Okay, just a second. I'm going to switch to my it's, track up. Okay, it's doable, but it, it's just like there's a, there's a shadow over your, over your presentation. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. That's much Apologies better. Fabulous. That. Great. Thank you so much. So my name is Gilles Yun and I'm, uh, I've been a science officer at Future Earth for a little over two years and since recently the lead for research and innovation. Um, it's within uh, these capacities that I've, I've been very much engaged in, in setting up a virtual summit, uh, which was originally planned to be an in-person meeting um back in in june earlier this year but it ended up being a, a three-day event which was scheduled uh from 1 p.m to 5 p.m central european time um and I'm, I'm here to basically share what kind of process we went through who the people were that we were engaged with um and and how we how we uh, uh basically designed it from, from behind the screens and 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 together with with our community um, just briefly background, um, the idea of our virtual summit uh, was to have a, or our summit was to have an event that corresponded with this sustainability research and innovation uh, uh, conference that we were uh, setting up together with Future Earth Australia and Development Forum, which was basically intended to be the, the world leading platform for sustainability researchers and innovators to, to gather. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to postpone this event and it was postponed to, to next year around the same time. But we still had a, a gap with the community that there were lots of urgent things that we needed to discuss. And our community is, is extremely large. Um, we have thousands of, of, of members within the Future Earth family um, that are all corresponding to different research projects, knowledge action networks, uh, global research projects national committees, regional committees, um, partners, uh, and so forth. Um, so it, it was a, a complicated um, task. So instead of also de delaying uh, this event, we decided to switch it to a virtual. And this decision really came um, just a few months before uh, we were gonna get started. We were just getting ready to start booking plane tickets to, to actually have this event in person where when actually when eventually the, the decision was made and we're talking about uh, something around three to four months uh, before uh, the event itself now some of the basically uh, key numbers that that are worth sharing well, by going virtual we actually s saved uh, 650 tons of carbon dioxide and about 150,000 us dollars on uh, hotel fees and with the big benefit of having instant accessible recordings of all the sessions, um, which was helpful to review, but also to strategize going forward and setting up uh, reports um, and support. Now, I have to give a lot of credits to this entire group here, which was the Future Earth 2020 Summit Planning Committee, 
These are representatives from the various entity groups within the organization. Um, so these are people, again, that are, are spread across different places around the world. We have representatives from the global research projects, national committees, uh, knowledge action networks, and then three people from the secretariat. I, I worked a lot with uh, uh, Vincent Verat from, from uh, the, the Paris hub um, together with Sandrine and myself being based in, in Japan. So time zone uh, was always an issue. Um, then together with this group, we invited uh, No Innovation, which is a, an organization that helps to set up workshops and, and does facilitation for actually scientific communities. And they had been uh, working on virtual activities as well. And we brought them in because, you know, we, of course, with Future Art, we, we have a lot of experience having online events purely because of our, our global distribution and, and just the wider spread of distribution of all our members. Um, but still, you know, researchers by themselves are not always the best communicators. And we felt that it would be added value if we had professional facilitators that could give us some hands-on tips on how to guide, how to organize, and, and how to really, you know, almost replace the in-person meeting and where everybody could, could come out of the event feeling like the objectives of the event were met. Uh, they get to know uh, different people from around the network and they feel like they contributed to the process. So those are really important uh, considerations uh, throughout the event. So no innovation really helped us to kind of spark out some of those small uh, decisions for the design of the event that ended up being very uh, useful. Now, overall, we, we, we originally had planned for a full one and a half day of summit in person. Uh, but also because of uh, feedback on the challenges of, of being on Zoom for many hours, we split it up in three different days, each day having a specific specific objective to be met, of course, with overlaps into, into other days. We looked at all the activities that we could start preparing beforehand, and we designed that into a, a uh, kind of a, a, a feedback exercise, not really a feedback, but a really a knowledge sharing exercise that went ahead of uh, the summit. And then we, we kept repeating also that out of this summit, we were gonna set up working groups that would then take all the decisions and, and, and knowledge that was created and we would share that uh, across uh, the organization future uh, further on. So the objective one was basically to share an update on future Earth in light of its midterm review. We had a a big review that went on and the members across the community had to understand what that review meant and how we were intending uh, to tackle that together with them. The second day was to then look into a value proposition and how to improve the relationship between the different entities and the secretariat, advisory groups and the governing structures and so forth. And on the third day, we started thinking about what are kind of like the products or activities that can uh, lead to added value uh, going, going forward. So we, we started basically the first day with, with having a basic a discussion on or a sharing of the basic rules of engagement, what we are expecting, how we wanted people to, to communicate either through chat or through the on, online platform that we had um, we had a, a platform that was designed also by, by uh, No Innovation, where you can add, it, add sticky notes so that, you know, generally speaking, when people add things in the chat, it's very useful to, to discuss on, but the speaker cannot really, you know, look at that at the same time. Um, and there's a lot of often very valuable information being shared in there. So we wanted to have a platform where that remains visible throughout all the different sessions that were out there and breaking groups. Um, then next, we had more of a, a, a focus on sharing a common understanding of the, 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 the community's diversity. So that meant that within specific entity groups, they had to get to know each other uh, better themselves. Then we would start cross-breeding 
uh, in a way that we started connecting these different groups with each other and all discuss um, their similarities rather than their differences and what they can contribute to the network uh, under a framework that was developed by, by a researcher called Kuberi National Library, who's based in Switzerland. Um, and I'll, I'll touch upon that uh, a little bit more uh, later. And day three, we basically talked about, you know, taking stock of what happened to the last couple of days and how we can move that forward. Now, this is how this three-day event looked like in an agenda. It, it looks fairly simple, but at the same time behind it, there's, there's a lot of decisions made. Every single session had a specific objective. It had descriptions on uh, how the facilitation had to happen, um, what kind of format was being used, uh, who are the note takers, who are the discussants, who are the back supporters. Um, and every type of, every color here also has a different meaning. So we had coffee chats, those were unscheduled, uh, well, scheduled in the sense that they're, they're, they're scheduled in the agenda, but they, they were unfacilitated opportunities for people to in, informally meet and discuss on opportunities around the summit. Um, while in, in the darker blue, we had um, parallel uh, discussion sessions where, where, group, where people had to virtually engage with each other. These were breakout sessions where uh, decisions had to be made or uh, uh, opportunities for, were being discussed. And then the light blue were all uh, plenary sessions where uh, the entire community is basically listening to one person that can speak at the same time, which is, of course, a big limitation, but that's also, uh, this was, um, given this limitation, uh, we, we, I think, managed to find a very good balance between this plenary session listening and knowledge sharing and reporting back, and then hands-on uh, breakout groups where people were working on specific uh, objectives. So just very briefly, um, we have the summit agenda, but then for, for every single session, uh, we had a very detailed description on you know, what has to happen because of course not one single person can be, can be managing such a massive event. We, we had various people working on this, uh, including the people from the community that were in the, on the planning committee. Um, they also actively took, took part in facilitating breakout sessions. And then we had people from the secretariat, from all across the secretariat that were taking notes and, and summarizing their specific sessions so that they could easily report back to, to the other uh, session organizers and so forth. So we, as I mentioned, specific objectives for every single session are important. Otherwise, people don't understand why, why they're in the room and how they're supposed to be contributing. Um, and that connected with a specific desired outcome. Um, otherwise, we feared also that we would lose interest from, from the community in that way. Um, this is uh, just Fairly briefly, I, I want to touch upon this uh, activity on the on the days on the second day, where we asked all the members of our community to contribute to uh, this framework, where they basically thought, like as an organization of them or as a network on a sub network of themselves, how they could uh, see themselves within this framework for co-design and identify where they are at the moment and potentially where they would want to be going and how they could fill up gaps uh, that some of the other networks um, are still facing so that they can um, collectively uh, achieve more than they can be doing uh, by themselves. So as I mentioned, this is a, a framework designed by Florina Schneider and was very well received uh, throughout the community. So it gave people already a, a purpose and an understanding of what was going to happen at the summit by participating um, in, in, in this exercise ahead of time. And then also understanding at the end of the day, they would see where they are based in the network right now and with which networks they might potentially be able to connect with uh, going, going forward. And then, as I mentioned, on the third day, we, we had uh, sessions that, that um, engaged various people of, of, of different uh, entities uh, on, on uh, working group related outcomes. 
Um, just really brief uh, before kind of uh, touching upon uh, the, the later part of my presentation, but this is a, a, a screenshot of the platform that uh, No Innovation had provided. Um, so a very practical to use uh, platform that we basically decided this is what we want in there. This is the information we want. These are the pre-reads. Um, everybody can make a profile so they can easily find each other. And then sessions where people click on um, that specify which Zoom room they have to attend to. And, and um, basically, you know, we didn't have any people that got lost along the way, which was which was great. And yeah, so we had very positive feedback uh, on the event. Um, we had a large group of people that said uh, they really loved this virtual meeting. Um, and they just, they got just as much out of it as, or potentially even more because it was virtual. Half of the participants thought that um, they didn't really find such a big difference between having an in-person or virtual meeting uh, at this event, but you know, maybe they still like an in-person meeting better. Um, so in a way, um, I think the design of, of the event and, and having professional facilitators uh, that of course, you know, you need to work with and, and you need to let them know really well about what your desires are for this meeting. Um, but this, um, this can actually result in a, in a very positive experience. Um, and finally, um, the, yeah, the process and the facilitation felt also really well. And I think this is really attributed to, to having professional facilitators in place. So I'll, I'll, I won't stay at this slide too long, um, but basically our lessons learned, um, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, there's really a lot of preparation that goes into this, the design, the content, the format, the stakeholders, the communication, both with participants or expected participants, but also within the organization, talking with the different entities. Um, we had capacity buildings uh, within the secretariat uh, to really prep everybody uh, so that they understand what's expected in the sessions, but what their roles are in the sessions as well. Um, and having yeah co-designed objectives with the community. Um, and that really had like those objectives had to be there for every single section session. Um, we definitely had a more inclusive event uh, because, you know, of course, people didn't have to travel, people that would have been stuck, um, unable to travel or too busy to, to join were able to join specific parts. Uh, it was a, certainly more inclusive. Um, uh, yeah, as mentioned, also only one person at the same time can speak. So it's really good to keep it short and simple, well designed. Uh, we really uh, had a very positive experience in the sense that we we had breaks um, and really encouraged people to step away from their screens so that they could, you know, take a breath again, take a, a bio break. Um, and one of the great things was that a lot of the, the people that we were engaged with were really happy to take part and, and lead discussions as well. Uh, so they had an opening and closing remark and they, they took leading roles in the, in the breakout groups, uh, which was really amazing uh, contribution by all of them. Um, and yeah, again, the, the informal chatting spaces were this additional little touch, uh, saying that before and after the events we had people that, you know, coming coming early and stuff. And instead of making them wait, we were putting them in breakout groups so they can informally uh, already connect with each other. Um, and then, yeah, some of the challenges, of course, this is already mentioned, but the time zone disadvantages are there. Um, also, English speakers tend to dominate the conversations. This is still a, a hurdle and, and a challenge also culturally uh, how to deal with that is, is still a, a rather big question mark, um, but also, yeah, the, the privacy concerns. So, of course, we had consent for recording, but then we were told not to, not to use it and not to to make it public. So, those were some of the the, the concerns. But uh, that's all. These are Thank the you, lessons Gilles. learned from Thank the future. Thank you. Event. Thank you, Gilles. Um, and again, I think there are some very uh, clear messages coming through. Um, you know, about, for example, what uh, 
and Angie raised with with language and what you're raising with language. Absolutely, I think particularly, you know, in, in again, we're about to have a Q&A session and sometimes people are shy about coming forward and this makes it makes it difficult uh, when you have those those language barriers. So I think that's another key lesson that we're learning is how do you ensure that you you have diversity and diversity of voices uh, when you have online conferencing. Okay, what I'd like to do now is set this up so we've got uh, the group back together again because now we're going to have uh, questions and answers. So what would be fabulous is if you do have any questions, if you could uh, raise your your hand and I'll do the best I can to moderate this, uh, this uh, discussion. Um, so would anyone like to be brave and, and go first? You can come in by putting on your video and, and waving at me like this or you can use the hands up function uh, in, the, in the discussion section. There must be some questions that people have had from this discussion. Yes, um, Hong Gan Zhu, over to you. And then we'll speak, then we'll hear from Phil. So Hong Yang, can you ask your yes. question? Thank you. As I said, I'm working from Bureau of Meteorology in Australia and I find that this meeting is very useful. And I also organized a workshop, any workshop uh, just the last week. And uh, that actually holds 320 people, participants. And we actually managed to invite like 16, uh, 12 keynote speakers from overseas. So I think here yeah, it was really somehow I found that this normally we only can hold about 220 people or 200 people but now because of watch meeting we managed to hold 100 more people to participant and uh, i actually from this talk i think there people didn't mention because for our case we use the microsoft teams to hold the meeting and a lot of people probably from overseas or university they use zoom meet people familiar with teams meeting so i found it very useful i actually had a testing session the one week before this one four hour in the morning so people actually can dive in and try to share their screen and to make sure because somehow people use mac had a problem so we actually help them to solve problem that has to guarantee the smooth running of the workshop so i think that's uh, somehow maybe zoom has less meeting but i less problem but i found with the microsoft teams Mm -hmm. have been very useful and also i think in some talks people said that people are can easily felt bored by this virtual meeting and we actually we had to set up this called gather tongue and hold social events so we had a social break so it's totally different media from microsoft teams and there people can actually they can set up the coffee rooms the poster rooms and the couch and people can sit together and like like a physical meeting that's actually a fun event. People enjoy it very much for icebreaker, you know, so even though, so we make it actually more colorful instead of only mm. talking about science. So we have somehow a different platform to actually hold social events and how to also have a poster session, have an e-poster, really like you click that and the poster come up and somehow you can see people just sit beside you. You can talk to people, discuss the poster. So that's actually, I we got also very positive feedback from that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Yang. And I think, again, you know, we have these different platforms, don't we? And again, the International Science Council is in the process of, of using Teams um, and that kind of technology. And I think the key message from you is that we need to keep abreast of, of, of technology. Um, and again, you know, when you have an in-person conference and you're having trouble with people missing flights or having visa problems, that just switches to having computer problems and you still have to put that energy into it. I'm going to get Phil uh, McManus to ask a question and then I'm going to get Jennifer Plall to ask her question. And then we'll go back to our group of speakers. So over to you, Phil. Thanks, Alison. Uh, my question's to Peter, uh, but any other speakers might want to chime in as well. And it's about the hybrid conference model and where it's not just online or it's um, not face to face, but when you're trying to integrate both and some of the challenges um, involved in that in terms of setting up hierarchies and you know, people engagement. So I was wondering if you have some thoughts you'd be willing to share about the hybrid conference model, please. 
Thanks, Phil. Peter, before I go to you, I'm going to get Jennifer to ask her question. Um, Phil, I think that's an excellent question and I think uh, we'll, we're going to explore this hybrid uh, model in, in, a, in a bit more detail in just a moment. Jennifer, let's hear from you and then we'll go over to Peter and, and the rest of our uh, speakers. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you everyone for your very helpful presentations. Um, I work as a senior project officer for the Global Young Academy and um, we have also had several online meetings since since the beginning of the year uh, with early career researchers. We've had some great experiences also come up with, come up to some um, boundaries. And my question is, what are some best practices for creating, recreating the informal mm -hmm. interactions? Um, some have been mentioned, um, but I would love to hear more. It's something we're still trying to figure out how to do better in the coming year. Thanks, Jennifer. Great question. And I think that's one of the key things that that online uh, can't replace is those random uh, discussions that you have with people after a plenary in, in a coffee break that that sparks creativity and, and future collaborations. Um, Peter, let's go over to you to look at Phil's question on hybrid models and you might also uh, talk a bit more about uh, why you want to choose a particular type of platform and I think that very much leads into that kind of question. So over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, Phil, thank you for asking that question. Uh, hybrid conferencing, um, as you would know, is almost always dependent on an in-person conference. So what a hybrid conference does is it feeds its content from the in-person event. And linked to that are different engagement strategies as to why would you want to offer a hybrid event? So pre-COVID-19, um, um, hybrid events were normally offered as a promotion strategy of your in-person event. And more oftenly, your hybrid component was then available free of charge to your online participants. Um, and the reason for that is because the online participants would not share in all the content of the in-person event. It was rather like putting a carrot out to say, look, this is what the online event is or the in-person event is about. Gee whiz, look at the great experiences that everybody are having at the event. This is the functionality. And then you carefully curate your program for the online community to be selective. Um, so there are certain sessions that you would want to broadcast to showcase the quality of the event. And then there's others that you are specifically not broadcasting because you would want to leave the online participants wanting more. And in other words, if you want to experience the full event, come to the event. Um, so those are some of the strategies. Uh, for example, uh, I'm not sure, I referred earlier to PCMA, the uh, Professional Convention Management Association. You may or may not know that they are hosting um, an event every year, the second week in January, um, called Convene, Convening Leaders. Uh, and that's done for about four and a half thousand in-person events. And they have the um, hybrid component available free of charge to everybody. Um, so I was able to, to, to connect, listen to the speakers that they connected me, but I was also led frustrated by those speakers that I couldn't access because I wasn't there. So my, the strategy is with the hybrid events in that instance, was to serve as a promotional uh, activity. Now, hybrid events is about uh, broadcasting content to people that could not attend in person for any, any reason. And that could be ex mainly accessibility issues. But you can also, what we found with hybrid events is that because it's an online engagement, we found that in-person participants are also connecting to the online uh, event in parallel and then quickly popping up, having a coffee conversation with a colleague that was following the conference from their tabletop, uh, whatever happened in session. So that is an option. 
Then another option is that you can curate content for your online audience that's not available for your in-person audience. So take advantage, for example, of your break times, your tea breaks, your lunch break, and have panel discussions on topics that have been either discussed early in the program or introducing new topics uh, for discussion. That way you can add a lot more value for your online participants and keeping them engaged uh, throughout the process. That is basically in a nutshell, um, the difference is what a hybrid event um, is opposed to a full digital event and how it adds value to your in-person event environment. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Do, do you foresee a future where, for example, where we might have had an international meeting in one particular city where you would end up having that international meeting in 10 different cities around the world where people could gather and, and then there's different, you know, so you're having slightly different conferences depending on where you are in the world, but then people are gathering in an online community to have a shared experience. Can you can you see that as being one of the yes. key challenges for the future? Yeah. That I think, model already exists. Yeah. Um, it has been introduced as a multi-app meeting by a gentleman from Belgium called Martin Van Neste. Uh, we invested heavily in that model. Um, and the benefit of that is we are looking at cultural differences in approaching the same problem for people to network within a localized environment and finding solutions to their local challenges, which may not be, um, which might very well be unique to their environment. Uh, and they find that solution, those solutions to address their concerns within a broader framework or a broader framework question um, that would apply to their local circumstances. That is a model that exists, uh, Alison, mm. uh, and people can research multi-app meetings yeah. and look into Martin this work. Thanks very much, Peter. Gilles, can I bring you in to answer Jennifer's very good question about how do we replace or how do we deal with that um, that networking, those interactions that happen. Um, it would be interesting to hear from you um, about the networking one-to-one -one experience you had with your conference. And then I'd like to bring back in Joanna and Angie to just give some of their comments about the, the discussion that's been ongoing, uh, particularly in terms of uh, what you've learned over the year and what you foresee your organization doing in the future. Gilles. Thank you. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And, and for us, that was one of the, the major things that we wanted to try to incorporate within the design of our, of our event. And the, the only way to really do that was to have designated spots that were not curated, not facilitated. And in some occasions, um, so as, as I mentioned, like we, we had this um, the system of people that are coming early, we would put them in breakout groups randomly and make them discuss. They could introduce themselves and, and so forth. And they, these were coming from all kinds of parts of around the world. Some of them were meeting in the morning, others in the, in the evening. Um, we also then had uh, one of the, the, the pages on, on the platform that we had, we offered opportunities for people to, to post topics of interest um, where we would then have specific slots where whenever somebody has a topic of interest and there's at least one person that also likes that topic, we would set up a Zoom meeting specifically dedicated to that topic. And everybody could basically uh, join uh, as they wanted or, or leave as they, they, they felt they had to, um, to those specific sessions. And that really somehow filled in the gap um, uh, or our challenges around having, you know, these this unexpected uh, meetings uh, and so forth. We also, of course, had the coffee chats um, and also something we called a, a water cooler, which allowed multiple people to join in in a single conversation. And depending on the distance you are to other people, you would not hear them as well. So you would have different subgroups within one space on your screen where people would be discussing about various topics. And you could just walk around like in real life 
Um, so th those were some with of that? the practical. Hmm? Sorry, which um, platform was that? Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> I, I think I think the platform issue is a very uh, important issue, and you know, if you if you want to have a very serious conference, which re which essentially replaces that in person conference feeling, you know, you really have to reach out to bespoke conference organisers, and I think Gilles, I, if if I recall, Future Earth. Uh, shifted the money that would have been spent on in person to to this online conference and it and it's serious money we, we you know we're talking a significant investment of money um so Julie, i think in follow-up it would be useful if we if we knew who those conference organizers were so that we can we can follow so jennifer perhaps could could follow up um but yeah, it, uh, for example, the hop in experience that that we've bought, it's it, I, I would say this is a, a uh, it gives you that networking experience. It gives you those exposition booths. Um, it gives you the plenary session. It gives you the breakout sessions. Um, but if you want to take it to the next level, that involves you know, virtual reality and avatars walking around and I mean you know we're talking a serious uh, investment. Um, Angie and Joanna let's let's bring you in. Um, Joanna I see that you're unmuted so let's go with you first and then we'll go with Angie. Um, what, 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 are, what are your takeaways for today's discussion? Yeah maybe uh, first I would like to uh, kind of add into the conversation around hybrid um, Hyper events. So we had an experience participating as well this year in the Development Studies Association conference that went completely online, of course, because of the COVID. And um, what we've done as well in collaboration with, the, I think what you're saying, Alison, is very important to be in touch with the conference organi organizers because they have their own ideas and their own technology, but they are, from our experience, also very welcoming of your own uh, ideas as a presenter of we, what would you like to do? What is the purpose of, of, of your presentation or of your gathering? Because what we did was basically another presentation. It was a, it was a couple of sessions uh, that were very much around uh, gathering participants' um, uh, ideas on challenges and, uh, and solutions for how technology actually can help uh, empower self and researchers to contribute um, better to, to positive change in, in their communities. So we really wanted to uh, kind of crowdsource uh, all of these um, ideas. And what we did first was basically also to uh, use a pin board, a padlet in, in, in advance of the conference, much in advance of the conference, to uh, kind of structure contributions for the interested people. We also offered to some of them, because our, these are researchers from southern countries, to you know, to the to are providing the best contributions and they were most active. That we will actually uh, pay the fees for them to participate in the in the conference in the workshop. Um, uh, and then we had like two sessions during the online conference, and uh, on purpose we did them one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, and they were highly interactive. We basically presented already. We had this body of of knowledge from pre-engagement, and then we uh, presented the outcomes. And the first session was very much about prioritizing the challenges in the breakout rooms, uh, small group work. And the second session was then about choosing um, uh, one challenge and possible solutions and designing together roadmaps. We had a person who was actually also scribing and, and uh, mm. in a very kind of nice way, representing this. So we have a great outcome that's also visual from this event. So I think it worked really well for us in that conference and we were really in touch in the conference organizers. We used Zoom instead of their um, uh, platform because it was just easier for our software researcher to join. Um, they experience very often like with Teams, for instance, uh, Microsoft Teams, we found that it's very difficult for some of our self and partners to actually be able to join Teams. It provides more challenges. Thanks. So, Thanks, Joanna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I, we're, we're going a little bit over. So if you have to leave, um, that's fine. But I think we'll just keep the discussion going for, for 10 more minutes. Um, Angie, can you let us know what your takeaways are? And I'm particularly interested to hear your thoughts on on hybrid models and and also the the language issues um, that that you've that you've dealt with in your 
in your meetings? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so a lot of the virtual meetings that we've had during this time have been um, sub-regional um, events that is looking at um, West Africa and West Africa is a um, bilingual region. So that is why we try to put in this aspect of having the translation. The oh, have we lost Angie? Is it just me who's lost Angie? I don't hear her anymore. Yeah, we've lost Angie. Okay. okay. Angie, we've, we've lost you for the moment, so we'll come back to you. What I'd like to do is if, um, if Vanessa, who has been very um, chatty in the chat, Vanessa has, has come up with a number of um, experiences. Vanessa Moss, would you like to share some of your experiences that you've had? Um, you've talked about a Padlet notice board and you've also talked about uh, uh, Spatial and other things like that. Would you mind just sharing your experiences and tell us which organisation you're with? And then I'm going to hand back over to Peter. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Alison. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I actually really like this kind of ability to, you know, interact in multiple ways. I know some people can, you know, it's hard to switch context and stuff, but I love that, you know, you can have chats with people um, and stuff. So I, I really like it. Uh, that's Vanessa, who are you? Chat. Which organization? Sorry, yeah. Just so I, um, I'm based in Australia. Um, I, in this context, uh, I'm a member of the EMCR forum, which is part of the Academy of Science. Uh, but I'm based at CSIRO, which is Australia's National Science Agency. Um, the, the context that I'm coming from is within CSIRO, I was the chair of um, a symposium, a, a cutting edge uh, science symposium on the future of meetings. Uh, we held that in September um, and we explored you know, a lot of similar things. So it was pretty nice to see very similar themes coming through all the talks today. Um, and just great to see that there are discussions about how we can be better for the future based on the experiences of you know, leading up to this point as well as the last six months as well. Um, yeah, so we, we I guess, are in the process of finalizing our report. We wrote a report with outcomes and recommendations, which also goes through the process of how we put TFOM together. Uh, we're hoping for that to be out before the end of the year uh, and that'll come out in various places like our Twitter feed and things. Um, and yeah, we're similarly to the, I guess the INASP case, we're trying to come up with what, you know, what are recommendations or practical things that people in different uh, contexts can do. So what can you do as an organizer? What can you do as an organization? What can you do as a participant at meetings? Um, I guess three of our, well, we had four key themes for us. It was accessibility inclusivity, sustainability, and technology. And so three of them are kind of goals. And one of them is like, you know, you can use technology to help you achieve those goals. Uh, so that's, those are the three things we kind of consider a lot of um, in terms of thinking about how to do events um, and how to make them as accessible and sustainable as possible. That, thanks, thanks, Vanessa. And uh, I hope that when you have this document ready that you can share it with the International Science Council because we'll put it on our members notice board as part of the knowledge sharing platform. Okay, yeah. um, uh, Peter, you know, would you like to just explain a bit more about um, as a professional conference organizer, the type of services that you have. And I guess if anyone is, you know, also the types of questions that people might ask a professional conference organizer if they've never had an online conference organizer before. And if you can do that in, a, in just a few minutes and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Listen, thank you so much. And I'm really not going to promote um, our company services and I would very much rather like to share um, our experience and, and, and learnings from the online, online space. Um, so it all depends on your capacity. If you're in an organization have internal capacity um, and the experience is by all means go for it um, because you understand your audience and your community based. If you need assistance, um, if you haven't done this uh, before and your lead times are very short, it's probably to your advantage 
uh, to get external assistance from those that have developed the capacity to do this in a professional uh, manner. Um, Alison, just perhaps two things uh, of importance, and it comes back to the question of Zoom fatigue um, and how to overcome that. And the only way to overcome Zoom fatigue is by keeping the interest of the participants. So it comes back to um, that opening remark that this is a one-to-one -one engagement broadcasted to many. So how do I engage you as an individual and how do I give, uh, how do I maintain your activity and participation in the event? So what do I create in my online space that would keep you constantly engaged, give you stuff to do, stuff to look at, and not only the presentation. So that forms part of an engagement strategy. How are you going to engage that participant that keep that participant focused on the actual event? It comes down to give that person something to do. Um, boredom strikes the moment that you have to listen uh, for an extended period of time to an individual. And this comes back to part of the design of the event, touching on sensory experiences. So in your in-person environment, you can touch all five senses. In an online environment, if you can touch three of those senses, um, you will make, um, would have made a lot of headway in engaging that person. So get that person to do something. It's either running a poll, yep. Yep. give the person a voice and give that person a real connection. Um, the one of the things that we don't like uh, to refer to is in, in this space is a virtual event. It's a notion of virtual event because that creates the impression that the event doesn't create real connections. Where in fact, it does create a real connection. So if you go to your different type of platforms. I can connect with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis with audio and with visuals. That in my mind is a real connection. So um, emotions, how do you touch people? So unless you touch anybody at an emotional level, you are not going to engage with them. How do you build that in? So part of the stu uh, uh, studies that we are currently undertaking is actually film making. Um, how do you, how does producers um, of uh, films um, engage their audiences um, and, and what are the techniques. So it's starting to look beyond the realm of event management um, for matters that apply to event management. If you leave me, I'll continue talking forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we do need to wrap things up and we have gone a little over, but I think this is a nice way to end because it goes back to what I said at the beginning. This is about the art of gathering and about why we gather and what messages are we trying to to put forward? What are our actual goals? And, and, and you know, at the heart of this, it's about creating communities um, that we might not have created before because we were having in-person events solely. So I I think uh, there's some challenges that you've given us today. All of our speakers have been able to provide some key learnings, um, some key challenges. And uh, as I said at the beginning, this discussion will be available uh, in a recording and we'll make the slides available as well. And in fact, if you're really keen, um, we're doing this event again at a different time zone uh, with different speakers. So there'll be even more experiences to share. So uh, Peter, Gilles, Joanna and Angie, if you're back, may I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank, you, Jean, uh, thank you, Angie. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. Do you want to have just one last word now that you're back? Um, yes, just to say in terms of um, hybrid models, it's something that we are also considering here because we have our annual scientific conference at the beginning of every year, which would typically bring in about 400 people. So we are now exploring the possibility of having that as a hybrid event at the beginning of next year. So just quickly. Okay, so another good example of pivoting but uh, uh, spending time to get it right. Um, 
Jenya, can I also thank you for your presentation, which will be available? And Anne, can I thank you for all the organising that went on in the background for this event? I hope everyone has a good rest of the evening or afternoon or morning, depending on uh, where you are. Can I thank you all for joining and I wish you uh, a very good day. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.